I am going to introduce both uh, Deborah and John, and I'm going to read some uh, notes so I don't forget exactly all those important details. So Deborah Meyer has worked as an artist for decades, creating drawings for her work as a glass engraver and art jeweler. Her work is in eight museum public collections, and she has won several, I would say probably many, awards, including an international award. These years influenced her work as a bird artist and trained her eye and hand to observe and draw the exquisite details of birds' faces, plumage, and feet. Deborah loves to watch and listen to birds and learn about their lives. Her, drawing, <coughs> her drawn bird images, married with John's poetry, are from their upcoming book, Quest of the Birds, a parable of a mixed flock of birds seeking their true self. So, welcome. It's so nice to see you, thank you and thank you. Um, you may know that uh, we have a falcon here, a kestrel, who has become a, an artist uh, as well, um, an injured bird used in education, and uh, I don't know if you've seen some of the, uh, the, the work, yeah. And uh, it's part of our silent auction. And we're amazed at the amount of uh, dollars bid for the two, <laughs> just staggering, really. So John, John and I have been talking about this, as I, as I said. And we also share uh, Meyer uh, relatives. I think my uh, grandmother was a, was a Meyer. Her uh, family, her grandfather and grandmother came from uh, from Germany, and so it's uh, we think maybe distant distant cousins. So. Uh, John's writing has been published in numerous national publications, and his books have received a combined thirty plus national and international book awards. His art is in twenty museum public collections globally. John is currently with his wife. <clears throat> I'm sorry. John is currently collaborating with his wife, Deborah, on a new book, Quest of the Birds, The Inner, sorry, Quest of the Birds, The Inner and Outer Journey, where we are going as individuals and will this lead to the destination within us? His poetry is combined with her exquisite bird drawings. So, and welcome, John. Um, I'm gonna turn this mic back over to Deborah. Thank you, Charles. Can I ask you to start? I'll start. All right. Okay. Uh, can you all hear okay? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Charlie. Thank, thank you, you for so much. introducing us. Sarah. And also thank you for making this exhibition happen. We're also thankful to the staff of VINS for their help in this. And um, we have been members of VINS for many years and we're inspired really by what we see here in our visits here. I, I remember on one of my first visits here many years ago, I had the opportunity to see a barred owl up very close. And as I looked into her soulful, beautiful eyes, I noticed that each eyelash was actually a tiny feather. And so it's this kind of exquisite detail that inspires me for my drawings and creating my drawings. So we have been collaborating on art for many years. I wanted to mention before I forget that all of the framed work here and the unframed prints in the store are all available for purchase 100% for the benefit of VINs and VINs' programs. To support their wonderful work, which we appreciate so yes. much. We've been fans of VINs for a long time. So, um, <clears throat> John and I worked together in creating our, the work for this book, Quest of the Birds, as Charlie mentioned. Um, and he writes the poetry and I create the drawings. And we work together to put the image and the poem on one page. I like to say that we marry the poem mm -hmm. and the image. <laughs> and which, which reminds us 
This is the 50th anniversary. Today is the 50th anniversary of our first date. <laughs> so we think it's a wonderful way to celebrate. And actually, my sister is here today, and she was with us. It was a kind of a group date. <laughs> we went to Montreal, remember? <laughs> OK. So. Um, we really enjoy working on this project together, and um, we thought we could just um, kind of have this as a more informal kind of talk. We appreciate lots of questions and interruptions. Please interrupt us if you have a question. And we thought we could just gather around each, each piece and um, talk about it. So. Um, this piece is entitled Knocking. It's of the woodpecker. And uh, the woodpecker, as you, a lot of birders know here, is actually a keystone species. And it's thus appropriate that we begin our discussion of our book, Quest of the Birds, with this bird. A few years back, we had a red-bellied woodpecker uh, visit our feeder. And this drawing is loosely based on the red-bellied woodpecker. You, don't want to use my drawings for any bird identification. <laughs> so um, when I'm actually working on a drawing, I feel like I kind of connect with the bird, and he kind of tells me, he or she kind of tells me what direction to go to. So I've always been very um, impressed with the ability of woodpeckers to climb straight up the trunk of a tree. And this one is doing just that while envisioning the higher realms of the crown of the tree. <laughs> so here's the poem. When will I hear that you have always been knocking on the door to my soul? So this was inspired by a young adult heron that actually flew into our backyard and landed there. And um, I had been uh, for, the, for the overall parable of the quest of the birds, which is the quest of each of us and all of us seeking what our inner true essence is. Um, I had been writing a number of poems and Deb had been doing a number of drawings. And in this, we did them independently in this case. And so this example, we looked at all the poems and we looked at all the images and picked the ones that could be married the, the best. Yeah, I'd say probably a lot of the ones that we have done, like Woodpecker was done that way too. We each independently did our work and then found a good match. But there have been times when I would do the poem first and Deb would then do a drawing and there'd be times when I'd be inspired by Deb's drawings to do a poem. So it's worked a number of different ways. So this one, he's reaching out with his foot, seeking to touch what is real. And the poem is lift a wing, soar beyond past and future to reach for ever living present. And one of the things that this is a metaphor is the fact that um, with all different types of people, all the diverse people, um, I think birds are uplifting to everyone. And so this in a similar way is saying lift a wing in that, in that metaphor of upliftment. Yeah, the quest of the birds is very much about metaphor. The outer reality and the inner reality. Um, how about Falcon next? Charlie mentioned the re wonderful resident Falcon here. <laughs> and um, this one is, is uh, loosely based on Peregrine Falcon. And I've always been impressed by their fearlessness and their very striking features. And this one here, she's holding the fire in her talons, lighting her way and warming our hearts. Another thing I'd like to say about this one is you notice that there's a lot of feathers here. <laughs> so 
I seem to get a specific request from her. Yes, draw every feather on my wings in great detail. <laughs> she was a demanding bird. But then I think about all the things that birds do for us, you know, all the services they do for us. Would you, have you read the poem, John? The fire of dedication brightens so many desperations. So oh, let's look at the pigeon and goblet next. And I think the technique of this is particularly interesting because, as we said, Deb was a glass engraver uh, prior to um, working in Faber-Castell colored pencils. And so she used to engrave birds and other uh, animals and scenery on the front of a piece of glass and on the back of a piece of glass, which gave uh, an incredible depth and translucency to the work. So what Deb has done is done her originals on vellum so that she could put an image on the front of the vellum and then turn it over and draw on the back and then sometimes even layer that with a second piece of vellum so it has that same kind of feeling of translucency that the glass engravings did previously. So in this one, um, John wrote the poem first, and I totally love the poem. Can you read it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. A single sip from your goblet drowns 1,000 dark shadows. So I found it a very inspiring poem. And he said, can you please draw a bird sipping wine from a goblet? And I chose the bird to be a pigeon but pigeon dove, they're interchangeable terms. And uh, I drew the pigeon on the front of the uh, sheet of vellum, and then the goblet on the back, and then the reflection of her beloved on, the, on a second sheet of vellum. So I guess we have the trilogy of the birds yeah. next. And this is the piece that um, Vince chose to put on their announcement. It's a piece that um, we worked on together from beginning to start. And it's a vision we share. Can you read the, sure. the poem? My vision saw multiple hues of birds flock and heal our planet. So I feel it's it's more than a, a poem here. It's really a prayer for the healing of our planet, its beings, and our hearts. And I chose to represent the flock by three birds. Three, I call them dancing birds. Have any of you ever seen raven sky dancing? I know my sister has because we saw it together. So it's, it was inspired by th that site too. And... Um, there's the blackbird with highlights of purple and, and blue in his wings and a sapphire eye. You have to get up closer if you want to see their eyes. <laughs> and the brown bird with highlights of bronze in his feathers and a golden yellow eye. And then the white bird with highlights of cream and rose with a ruby eye. And they all have blood red hearts as we all do, no matter how different we appear outwardly. So we thought that's a nice metaphor. No matter what color we are, or ethnicity or background, we all have the same color heart. Um, so this, this uh, group of, of five works here is a taste of the book that um, Charlie mentioned, Quest of the Birds, The Inner and Outer Journey. And it's, um, a, uh, it's a project we're working on now, developing all these poems and it drawings into what will be a book or, two, or more. And it's three. <laughs> Can I ask about the, um, the process of the planet, the image of the planet that the birds? Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm thank very you. curious. Yes. The beautiful blue marble of our planet. And, um, 
If you come closer to, you'll see there's spiral nebula behind. Mm. So you'll see one of the continents there. And yeah, that was on a second sheet of vellum, actually. And it, the way we um, put it on the, on the page really makes it look like it's in an egg, like a mm -hmm. cosmic egg or something, yeah. which I thought was cool. Yeah. yeah. So, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay. Thank you very much. As you can imagine, it takes Deb a long time to do her drawings compared to me doing the poetry. Yeah, he so, gets like this, he writes it down. I get something from the beyond and write it down. And Deb labors over her drawings for weeks sometimes, sometimes longer. So people ask us sometimes, well, how long is it going to take you to complete this book? It's going to be a while. But we love the process. Is, was this one processed autonomously or collaboratively? We worked on that collaboratively. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense because you're dealing with the whole world. Right. Yeah. And beyond. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. So, How many total works do you expect to be in the book in its entirety? Well, I don't know. I was, I was talking to our, our friend Steve. Where are you, Steve? <laughs> there you are. I was like, how many do you think we should have? Like, I mean... Um, we haven't really decided. I can't really limit myself to like 40 birds because there are just too many fantastic birds. So I'm thinking maybe three books. And John said, hmm. Oh, three books. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, Steve mentioned, rightfully so, he said that sounds like a lifetime project. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. So previously uh, in the books, um, there have been somewhere around 55 to 65 images and poems. I've got some examples of books here um, of the previous three books, and those are available for sale for the benefit of Vins up in the store. But let's go and start to look up close at some of the photographs with the poems. We can start down at this end. And this is called Live on the Poetry Diet. Now, we've all heard about this diet or that diet, and this one is a fad diet, and that one is guaranteed to work. And it seems like our culture is obsessed with dieting. So I thought, why not have a poetry diet? So the poem is Live on the Poetry Diet, read a book, lose a pound, get skinnier and skinnier until all that is left is a giving heart. So I've had a number of people that said they'd like to sign up for that diet. <laughs> this next one is called Up the Long Mountain, and it has Camel's Hump, which many of you know is one of the prominent mountains for viewing and hiking in Vermont. And I had, since it's in central Vermont, it can be seen from Lake Champlain, it could be seen from many, many places in Vermont. So I had written this poem, Up the Long Mountain, which had the mountain and the stream. And so I was looking for a spot for a long time that could incorporate both. And I happened to be driving on Route 2 one day and noticed that the Winooski River was here flowing and Camel's Hump was in the background. So I pulled the car over and walked down a steep bank and in order to get this photo with a perspective of the river and the mountain, it was all very, very muddy. So I kind of sank down ankle deep in the mud as I was trying to get the right uh, perspective for taking the photo here. So it is, I follow the river up the stream and over rocks placed there by ancient changes. At last I reached the summit to find you and I were there all along. I think John Long is a great word for that because the trail from the river to the mountain is six mile, a six mile walk, so Long is very really appropriate there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Um, the next one is called Your Door. And some of you might recognize this. It's been replaced since. But this was the old cemetery door in Norwich 
below the cemetery. And you may know that in years past, in the wintertime, if someone passed away, they weren't able to dig a grave during the winter. So they had these special crypts that the bodies could be kept in until spring when they could then dig out the, uh, the grave for burying the body. And this was, was one of them. And as this ancient door, I think hundreds of years old, uh, had a metal uh, covering that was rusting away, it just seemed very beautiful in a way. So uh, that inspired the poem. A glance has brought me to your door. I knock, you open, let me in, and become my source of inspiration to light my path. This next one um, is also in the upper valley during the winter. And um, uh, just a, th a thought I had about how much we are willing to, um, I guess, sacrifice to find our inner selves. And the, the poem reads, am I ready to throw off the coat of wanting and dance naked with you in the freezing fields of dawn. <laughs> Quite a thought. What, what did I find for an answer? <laughs> I like to be warm. Um, There's the author. <laughs> yeah. yeah. John's in that one. I'm in the, I'm in the sled there. And Deb's dad had been in the 10th Mountain Division and was a great outdoorsman. And he had always wanted to go dog sledding and had never had the opportunity to do that. And he was in his 80s when we um, hired, uh, a, a, I guess you'd call him a sled dog trainer, his sled and his dogs, to go dog sledding up in Maine. And so... Here I am with the dogs on the sled. Now, one thing I have to say was, as the first time we had ever been dog sledding, he explained all the things to us and how to operate a dog sled, which doesn't seem, when you think about it, all that complicated. I mean, the commands you're supposed to give are tighten up, and he wanted us to talk in a whisper to the dogs. And the dogs would tighten up all of their harnesses, and then you just say very quietly, let's go, and they take off. What I didn't realize the first time was how vigorously they took off. Yeah, they love their work. They <laughs> love to run. So I found myself hanging on to the handlebars of this sled with my feet out straight. That's true. Hanging on for dear life as these dogs <laughs> took off. It took me quite a while to get my feet back on the runners, and I thought... Okay, there's an experience of dog sledding I never thought about before. So that is the image and poem. You help me transcend limitations. Whatever we focus on and completely pursue, we become. Now the next one is called You Sent Your White Horse. And I wrote the poem first. Actually, I like to say the poem was sent to me from the beyond. And then I needed to find a white horse. So I looked all over the state of Vermont, drove all around back roads, farms, tried my best to find a white horse that would be suitable for taking a photo of. And then I discovered, I was out on a bike ride one day, that just down the road from where uh, we lived in Norwich was a white horse. And this horse was named Bianca, I think. Candy knew the horse. You knew the horse. <laughs> Bianca was quite a character. Um, as Bianca's owner explained, um, her owner gave lessons, horseback riding lessons. And Bianca always liked to test out the, the student rider. And so as the, as the owner came up and introduced the, the student to Bianca, Bianca would take her hoof and gently put it on the student's foot and then apply more and more pressure to see how the student would react. And so Bianca was kind of a, I guess, a, 
a scamp in a way. <laughs> that, that she had that aspect or personality. Yeah, she had spirit, you'd she say. She had a lot and of spirit. And she liked writers that had spirit, too, I guess. Anyway, I got, to, yeah. I got to spend the whole afternoon with Bianca and her owner and took many, many photos and chose this one for this image and poem. And the poem is, You sent your white horse to carry me away, my beloved. Where I go doesn't matter anymore as long as you are the destination. One more on this wall, and uh, this, um, uh, Deborah and I like to go hiking, and this is a view from the summit of Mount Washington, which many of you have climbed and you may know as a popular hiking spot in New England. This is looking down toward the Lake of the Clouds and the Lake of the Clouds shelter there. And the poem is, we must love past what we think we are or what we believe we can be. So, over here in this corner is a poem and image called The World in a Lover's Eye. And I had never been to Martha's Vineyard and was in the process of putting together a book called Love Poems from New England. So I thought, well, I'm obliged to go to Martha's Vineyard for the first time. And I had heard of the Akanak Cliffs and their beautiful variously hued sandstone. So I was there taking photos and a distinguished gentleman walked up to me and I struck up a conversation with him. You know, you, when you first meet someone, you say, hi, how are you? How you doing? And then you say, where do you live? And when I asked him where he lived, he pointed down the hill and said, that's my place down there. So trying to continue the conversation, I said, well, have you lived there for a while? I guess that's something the Vermonters ask a lot. Anyway, he said yes, and in fact, my family has lived in the area for over 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. And I went, 10,000 years? He said, yes, I'm a Wampanoag, and my ancestors greeted the pilgrims when they came to Massachusetts. So that was Captain Buddy Vanderhoop. And, uh, had a delightful conversation with him, and he pointed out various things around that area uh, of, of Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. He was a fishing captain that took people on um, fishing tours, and he like took uh, Jimi Hendrix or somebody oh, like and, that. And I don't know, he used to take these big rock stars on. Yeah, he'd tours. take rock stars on his boat, uh, and he loved to tell them stories of the Wampanoag. So he was quite a character. Now, this one over in the corner um, is uh, a black and white image that I took for the book Clouds. And I was driving down Route 7. I had just been down to visit uh, Robert Frost's home in southern Vermont, just north of um, Bennington. And I was driving north on Route 7, and I drove by a marsh, and it slowly dawned on me how beautiful the marsh was. So I had driven a mile or two past. I turned the car around and drove back and waded out into the marsh. I didn't have any waders or any, any high boots or anything. And then waited until the ripples on the marsh subsided and everything was glassy uh, clear again and took this photo. When the ripples on the waters of the innermost grow calm, reality's reflection become clear. When the ripples on the waters of the innermost grow calm, reality's reflection becomes clear. Um, actually, Sandy Pearson is here today, and I had asked Sandy, who loves to hike around New England, uh, I had a poem uh, that was called Thundering Silence. And I asked her, do you know of a waterfall somewhere that I could go and take a photo of to go with the poem? And she said, yes, in fact, I know about Thundering Brook Falls, and you ought to go there. And so I did. And Thundering Brook Falls really lives up to its name. It's near Killington. When you get to the bottom of it, there's a nice walkway, a, 
uh, plank, wooden plank walkway to get there. The falls are so loud that it's almost like silence. You can't speak because you couldn't be heard. And nothing can be heard but the thundering sound of the waterfall itself. It's a very, very beautiful spot. And it's a gem on the Appalachian Trail. It's on the Appalachian Trail. That it is. Thank you. So you run to greet me on the path to love without a footfall sound. We meet and I embrace your bliss and thunderous silence. The next image here um, you might uh, recognize as Mount Katahdin, which is the northernmost terminus of the Appalachian Trail. And so I thought, well, if I'm trying to find some of the iconic images of New England for the book, Love Bones from New England, I should go and take a photo of that. And I was really struck by how the image of the mountain reflected so beautifully in this lake below it. So the poem is, true freedom comes from within, no matter how surfaces appear, or where you come from. It's a beautiful, beautiful spot. Um, now for this image called Pump the Breath, it was for the book Love Poems from Vermont. And I searched all over Vermont for an old fashioned pump and I couldn't find one. So finally I found one that was for sale. And so I bought that pump after of course after that, of course, and after I took the, after the book came out, I have found some other pumps. Yeah, our friend Vermont. Sandy knew of several in New Hampshire. <laughs> right, <laughs> but I wanted a, I wanted an old-fashioned hand pump from Vermont, and as as you know, these pumps at one time were the way to get your water, and many people s still use them. Some for their primary source, and some as decorative uh, enhancements to their property. So the poem is, you pump the very breath into my lungs and the blood into my heart until every cell calls out your name. You pump the very breath into my lungs and the blood into my heart until every cell calls out your name. Now, the next image is of the petroglyphs um, in Bellows Falls. I did some research and was amazed that there are petroglyphs in Vermont. I never knew that. And so I made many phone calls to find out where they were and how they could be seen. I found out that there's an old bridge that crosses from uh, Bellows Falls over into New Hampshire called the Villas Bridge which has been shut down. It was built in the 1920s and is in such bad disrepair that it's not used anymore. And I had heard that these petroglyphs were right near the bridge. So I went down a number of times uh, to try to photograph these petroglyphs and couldn't find them. So I called some people in Bellows Falls and some of them actually volunteered to show me. It turns out I had been searching on a, on a bright sunny day and they said you have to go on a cloudy day. But if you walk out onto this bridge, which is, you know, it's closed to traffic, but it's certainly strong enough to walk on. And then you look back down um, toward the cliff below, uh, you can see these petroglyphs, um, which were done by the Abenaki um, somewhere between 300 and 3,000 years ago. So I called up Joseph Bruchak, whom you may know has written many, many books on the Abenaki. He's an Abenaki himself, and his son is one of the primary translators of the Abenaki language into English. So I had a nice conversation with Joseph and asked him about some, the, these particular petroglyphs. And he informed me that these petroglyphs were used to help souls of the Abenaki fly their way uh, after 
they departed the, the Abenaki humans. So the, I thought about the Abenaki, their struggle for recognition, and uh, the fact that for many years in Vermont, Abenaki people would not announce that they were Abenaki because they were concerned that the state government and other groups um, would force them out of their Abenaki rituals. So the poem is, um, sorrow can etch the stone, but joy's opportunity returns with each sunrise. This is in the process of being turned into a World Heritage Site. And that's a long process. So the people in Bellows Falls uh, have been working on that. This next one is called Walk on Water Frozen. And it's actually an image from the canopy walk here at Vince. Um, if you haven't had the opportunity to go on the canopy walk, I assume it's open, Sarah. It's a wonderful experience, the canopy walk. So I encourage all of you to do that. And you look out over Vins itself and out over the river, and uh, it's, it's quite a scene. Um, and it made me think, because it was in the winter and everything was frozen, about the future of Vermont, the future of our climate in Vermont. So the poem is, anyone can walk on water, frozen, in Vermont winter, for now. We can all experience Jesus, but colder. Today's wonder is a frozen pond. Tomorrow, with a question mark. And this next image is quite close by also, climbing from the abyss. It's the Queechee Gorge, which is in walking distance down the road. And a very beautiful spot, one that many, many people in Vermont and from outside of Vermont come to visit. Climbing from the abyss, we heard the glory sound of suns. Sun's venerable rise is now your light of all I see. That's the Queechee Gorge in autumn. And this last one is, in a way, in celebration of today, which is Veterans Day. Um, both of Deb's parents uh, are buried there. Deb's dad was in the 10th Mountain Division and fought in World War II in Italy and uh, was quite an outdoorsman. And we loved tromping all over the North Woods with him uh, when we were a young couple. And he Our, loved birding, too. He loved birding as but, well. But um, he couldn't hear the birds. So I said, OK, you find the birds, <laughs> and I'll listen to them, because <laughs> he was, had good eyes for finding them. <laughs> so this is an image of the Vermont Veterans Cemetery. The dew from your brow runs down the harp string you tied to my heart. The dew from your brow runs down the harp string you tied to my heart. Okay, where is that located? That's located uh, in Randolph, Vermont. And if you're driving north on Route 89, take the Randolph exit. Instead of going down toward Randolph, make a right turn and go up the hill and when you get to the T, make a left, and the veteran cemetery is back there. It's a very beautiful, beautiful site. So that concludes the tour. Are there any questions uh, about uh, our work with birds or some of the other work? Okay, well, thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>